in Helena Wren's satirical slasher Bodies, 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 a weekend getaway amongst a group of wealthy Gen Z friends transforms into a night of accusation, terror, and ultimately bloodshed. Far from merely a whodunit mystery, the film cuts deeper, utilizing archetypal horror tropes to function as social commentary. At its core, the film critiques Gen Z's reliance on the simulacra of friendship, where curated social media personas and anxieties fueled by online comparison create fertile ground for the destruction of genuine connection and trust. We'll be trapped in the house with some spoilers, so be wary. And if you've been watching and not subscribed, now would be the time to click that button. What is your podcast about? Hanging out with your smartest and funniest friend. French sociologist and philosopher Jean Baudrillard thought that there were four levels or orders of abstraction. The first order is a direct representation, a faithful copy, like a photograph. When you see a Mandela Stenberg or Pete Davidson on your screen, the images captured are faithful representations of the actors and what they look like on set that particular day. Well, I just look like I fuck. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I look like I, f I fuck. The second order is a manipulation. It's an Instagram post where the skin has been smoothed and the circles under the eyes erased. It's not just a representation of reality anymore, it's a perversion of reality. The third order is an absence of a profound reality. Take bottles of diffuser oil. One is tea tree and the other is springtime breeze. The tea tree, the lilac, and the honeysuckle mint are all first order. They recreate the smell of their namesakes fairly accurately. But what does a springtime breeze smell like? Doesn't that depend on where you live? If I live near an ocean, the breeze is going to smell differently than if I live across from a bakery or a slaughterhouse. And yet, it does smell. It has extracts from half a dozen different flowers, all trying to evoke springtime. But that's just it. The springtime that Better Homes and Gardens is selling you is an ideal. It's a concept of spring. It's a thought, not a reality. By the time we hit the fourth order, there's basically no reality left. This is the realm of deepfakes, cryptocurrencies, non-fungible tokens, and anything else the virtual world can imagine. It's also the realm of storytelling especially in a digital age where anything can be recreated to be photorealistic. When I think of fourth order representation, I think of the character George Kaplan from the Hitchcock movie North by Northwest. In the film, Kaplan is a superstar secret agent hot on the trail of anti-American agent Philip Van Damme and his crew. Hilarity ensues when ad executive Roger Thornhill is mistaken for Kaplan because no one knows what he looks like, and Van Damme's henchmen try to kill Thornhill. The twist is, spoiler alert from 1959, what are you doing watching this if you haven't seen North by Northwest? Go watch it, it's amazing, and it's on Tubi for God's sakes. The twist is, that George Kaplan isn't real. Kaplan is a fiction created by the American government to distract Van Damme from their real agent. They buy plane tickets for Kaplan, and make hotel reservations under the name Kaplan, and have someone drop off his dry cleaning, all under the guise that there is a real Kaplan chasing Van Damme across the country. And as far as practicality is concerned, there's no difference between a real George Kaplan and a fake one. As far as Van Damme is concerned, he's real, and that's all that matters. I don't suppose it would do any good to show you a wallet full of identification cards, driver's license, things like that. They provide you with such good ones. Kaplan is part of what Baudrillard calls hyperreality, a state of reality where the signs that refer to reality directly and the signs that have no direct relation to reality become blurred and indistinguishable so that no one can really tell if there's a real buried underneath all the symbolism. Ultimately, Roger Thornhill comes to embody George Kaplan, doing all of the things that a super spy needs to do to save the woman he loves. Fiction becomes truth as reality grows to conform to the fabrication. What happened to the first two marriages? Oh, I think they said I led too dull a life. <sighs> one more example. When C-list movie star Ronald Reagan decided to run for president in 1980, his campaign stressed his experience as head of the Actors' Union and as governor of the state of California, both high-level executive positions that require a lot of organizational skill. He didn't run as the guy from Bedtime for Bonzo. And whatever you thought of Reagan's presidency, he wanted to be thought of as a serious presidential candidate who was up to the job. Fast forward nearly a quarter century later, California has recalled his governor. An 80s movie action star Arnold Schwarzenegger has thrown his hat into the ring to be California's next governor. And did Schwarzenegger follow in Reagan's footsteps, jettisoning his reputation as a movie star? No. He advocated for a total recall of Governor Gray Davis. 
He promised to terminate taxes. He used terminate a lot, actually. You believe that we must be fierce and relentless and terminate terrorism, then you are a Republican. And when he was re-elected, he talked about his love of doing sequels. And at the RNC convention in 2004, he famously accused Democrats of being economic girly men. And to those critics who are so pessimistic about our economy, I say, don't be economic girly man. And it worked. Schwarzenegger was so popular after one year as governor, there was talk of amending the constitution so he could run for president. By the end of his run, though, the cracks were starting to show. It was revealed that Schwarzenegger had an extramarital affair and fathered a child with his mistress. The actual human being, the reality, was not as romantic as the movie star come governor that Californians had fallen in love with. Arnold the real guy was playing the part of a movie star playing the part of a governor. That's what people liked. Except, no? That's not quite right either. Remember this from like 45 seconds ago? Don't be economic girly man. That's not a Schwarzenegger line. That's Hans and Franz, the Kevin Nealon and Dana Carvey characters from Saturday Night Live. Try, but hear me now and believe me later. We can easily crush girly men like grape. Hans and Franz were parodies of Arnold Schwarzenegger, his Austrian accent and his obsession with weightlifting. And because parody is an exaggeration that distills a few personality and affectation quirks into a meme, the meme is actually more recognizable than the thing itself. So they're not parodying a real guy, they're parodying his curated public persona. And now his curated public persona is adopting a parody of itself. Fiction becomes truth as reality grows to conform to the fabrication. So we have SNL creating an exaggerated parody of Schwarzenegger's movie characters, Schwarzenegger running for governor as his movie star persona, Schwarzenegger then adopting the language of parody as if it's his own, and everyone is eating it up because we're now four layers deep in representation. Nothing that we're judging resembles the real guy. We're judging a fictional simulation of a man. And we came to expect that from our celebrities in the 24-hour cable news cycle and e-network era. The British and Italian tabloids became particularly brutal in their pursuit of ripping away the celebrity facade and exposing the real person behind the star. And if the real person wasn't ugly enough to be interesting, either physically or spiritually, you simply manufacture a simulation of that person to throw to the wolves. This led celebrities to create hyper-curated personas for public consumption as a way to control how they're perceived. So we get happy-go-lucky everyman Ryan Reynolds, an insufferably awkward yet stunningly gorgeous Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> I do that. We get rappers burnishing their street cred and country stars declaring their allegiance to conservative causes. And all of this is really easy now because of social media. If you're good at Twitter, it earns you a lot of social capital. Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman have a very public bromance that is simultaneously the most wholesome thing you've ever seen and a scripted public relations scheme to ensure that both guys are relatable. But the thing is, social media isn't just the realm of the elite celebrity the way that legacy media were. Anyone with an email address can get a social media account. And that means that the average everyday citizen now has to curate a public persona. If you're a boomer, that means sharing a picture of Jesus in front of the American flag holding an AR-15 and a cheeseburger telling everyone that your grandson bet you you couldn't get a million likes. If you're an elder Gen Xer, you complain about how no one drinks from the hose or rides in the back of a pickup truck anymore. If you're Gen X minor, and I think we need to make this clear, there is a definite dividing line between elder Gen X and younger Gen X. If you're younger Gen X, you mostly just lament the fact that the resurgence of 80s pop culture nostalgia has waned, and you're back to telling all the kids these days that you recognize the original songs that were sampled to make the Koi Ray music. But any younger than that, and you've likely grown up with a dual identity. A real life persona you have with your IRL friends, and an online persona that you've developed for your social media accounts. And these two people are often very different. Physical you has to eat, to sleep, to procure shelter. Social media you doesn't have to eat, sleep, or find shelter. It's born on Maslow's third base, seeking social validation and camaraderie. And so social media you is programmed to communicate differently than you would if you were speaking to someone in real life. And it's why there are drills and cat turd twos in the world and why randos are begging Audrey Plaza to rail them. Why do you guys want me to rail you? Because I could. It's unlikely that that communication would be delivered or perceived the same way in real life. When Baudrillard developed the concept, it was mostly theoretical. But in the modern age of social media manipulation, AI-generated deepfakes, and convincing consumer-grade production suites, the fourth order has arrived with a vengeance. We're no longer just curating our online personas. We have companies offering totally virtual relationships with artificial creations. Hot fourth order simulacra. Vet. 
fucks. Jean Baudrillard's theory of simulacra provides a critical framework for understanding the interpersonal relationships in Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Baudrillard's worst fears were that the blur between the real world and simulation of it would create an indistinguishable din of reproduction where no one would be able to fall in love, create lasting friendships, or even trust anyone else ever again because they'd be indistinguishable from the artificial. Take the characters from Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. They exist in a social ecosystem where staging elaborate displays of friendship for social media becomes their primary mode of interaction. So you do read the chat. Why is everyone so obsessed with the chat? Shared inside jokes, meticulously documented moments, and a relentless focus on trendy language replace true intimacy. You're always gaslighting me! These manufactured displays of friendship create a simulation of connection, a comforting but ultimately fragile illusion. Of course, the way that it gets there is through the routine slasher movie formula, a bunch of kids and one Gen Xer decide to ride out an impending hurricane in a posh mansion while playing the party game of the title. Or werewolf, or mafia, or whatever it was called in your neck of the woods. One of them goes missing before the movie even begins, and another winds up dead with his throat slit, setting off a whodunit. But more importantly, ripping off the facade that each of the characters have been wearing with the rest of the group. The first shot of the film is a highly sensual kiss between Sophie, played by Amanda Sinberg, and B, played by Maria Bakalova. It's a rare moment of genuine connection in the movie that director Helena Wren wanted to put in to establish the theme of sociality versus primal instincts. But I wanted to start with something very sensuous and animalistic, because to me this whole film is about are we civilized or are we underneath it all beasts? And it's the film's first implication that there is something being hidden as Sophie tells B that she loves her and B doesn't answer her back. Instead, the film cuts immediately to both women scrolling on their phones and ignoring each other, even though they're only a few feet away from one another. And if the point isn't driven home hard enough, Sophie tells B that she can't judge the friend group by their socials. They're not as nihilistic as they look on the internet. That's just like what they want you to think. The film cleverly translates anxieties around the simulacra of friendship into classic horror elements. This is especially true when the requisite everybody's a suspect trope kicks in. B's nervousness makes her awkward when she first meets the friend group, so David compares her to a school shooter. It's like he doesn't know how to process an authentic human emotion, so he attributes a cultural symbol that he does have access to. Jordan is also fixated on B, but her suspicion seems more personal, like B is an outgrouper to be suspicious of. Around the same time, Sophie asks David to forget their group chat and live in the now which is the film's underlying theme. It is a thrilling game, but of course, it is just a metaphor for all the the relationships that they have with each other and how they act and how their relationship with their phone is and all of that. David, played by Pete Davidson, spends most of his time in the film drunk and coked out of his gourd as he tries to hide his masculine insecurities when hunky Greg is around. And Greg is more charismatic, partly because he looks like Lee Pace, but mostly because he's more self-assured than everyone else. David is more concerned with the vibe he's putting out. And it's all fun and games until someone starts crying. In this case, David starts in on Greg, who decides he's too old for this shit and pieces out. David then starts in on his girlfriend Emma for oversharing about their sex life with the group. And this starts an argument about the abuse of social justice speak. Gaslight is like one of the most overused words ever to like the point of annihilation. Like what's next, you're gonna call me a narcissist? For what it's worth, it feels like this movie and Rain are on David's side on this one. Yeah, and this is so they are all bullying each other in a very intellectual way. Like they know everything. They have all the words, they have all the vocabulary. They've read all the articles. In the same way that online conservatives perform conservatism by shooting at Bud Light cans, burning their Nikes, or downvoting media they've never even seen, leftists perform leftism by assigning moral and psychological labels to behaviors under the guise of group hygiene and spreading awareness. Don't call her a psychopath, it's so ableist. If elder millennials spend too much time on WebMD diagnosing themselves with exotic diseases, then zillennials spend way too much time on Tumblr diagnosing other people. And that's what Rain is criticizing in this scene. The consequence of all this is now both Greg and David are isolated from the group somewhere in the mansion. The premise truly begins when David shows up with his throat slit, setting off a real bodies bodies body scenario where the women try to figure out which one of them, if any, is the killer. As the night progresses, paranoia becomes a potent force. Fueled by suspicions based in online perceptions rather than genuine knowledge, the friends turn on each other. You ran away to go write your fucking memoirs. It's creative nonfiction, which is a valid response to life and an attention economy. The game Bodies, Bodies, Bodies itself becomes a metaphor for the performative nature of their bonds. 
Accusations are thrown in the darkness, trust evaporates, and the consequences of relying on Samulacra emerge. Does she know? Does she know what? That you begged me to stop at your apartment on my way up here. B kills Greg, taking his self-defense as an aggressive act. And of course, as soon as she does, these characters who were draped in the language of tolerance about mental health issues immediately start to speculate that he snapped because he was a veteran. He's a vet? Right? Like Iraq or... No, I thought it was Afghanistan. He was a veterinarian. And it's jokes about stereotyping and jumping to conclusions like this that make up most of the film's absurd humor. This whodunit mystery culminates in probably the film's most famous scene, in which the women's actual selves are exposed. Despite their actions as liars, cheaters, bad friends, and just generally being selfish jerks, they throw out the bastardization of wokeness as a shield. Oh my god, we are all drowning in your fucking feelings! Feelings are facts! To be clear, the real definition of woke, which refers to the awareness of the systemic nature of oppression, is irrelevant here because, much like online critics, these characters don't give a fuck about the nature of systemic oppression. They care about the appearance of giving a fuck about the nature of systemic oppression. The simulacra. It's why this line... Your parents are upper middle class. ...is simultaneously so funny and devastating within the narrative. The escalation of paranoia and violence echoes the toxicity and destructive potential of some online interactions. The characters relentlessly tear each other down, driven by insecurities and envy stemming from an obsession with social media comparison. Verbal attacks swiftly escalate into physical harm, with the film suggesting that friendships forged in performative simulations carry an inherent danger of collapsing when the illusion can no longer be maintained. Did you just fucking shoot me? In its climax, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies offers a harsh critique of Gen Z's over-reliance on a socially constructed simulacra of friendship. By highlighting the inherent emptiness of interactions mediated primarily through online platforms, the film challenges the audience to examine how these simulations undermine genuine emotional connection. While the film's satirical approach offers a darkly humorous lens, it also poses a critical question about the long-term social and psychological consequences of allowing social media personas to replace genuine, vulnerable relationships. Ultimately, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies isn't just a horror film, it's a cautionary tale about the potential that lurks behind the curated facades of the digital age. And that's Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Stay warm, stay safe, wash your hands, return your shopping carts, make good choices, and I'll see you next time. Okay, I'm bored in a house and I'm in a house board. Bored in a house and I'm in a house board. Bored in a motherfucker in a house board and I'm bored in a motherfucker in a house board. Bored in a house and I'm in a house board. Bored in a house and I'm in a house board. Bored in a motherfucker in a house board and I'm bored in a motherfucker in a house board.